tonight along the border. From the fields there comes the breath of newborn hair. I recorded that just minutes before y'all got here. Hi. Welcome to Hoosier Storytellers, a program bo uh, for and about the people of Frankfort, Clinton County, and Central Indiana, presented by the Frankfort Community Public Library. I'm your host, Mike Clausen. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to thank everyone in attendance here in the Scanta Theater today uh, for coming down to the library and welcome those of you who may be watching right now or in the future on YouTube. Normally, we'll talk to our guests for 30 or 40 minutes. Then we'll let you all ask them some questions at the end. We're going to do the same thing today, uh, but we're looking forward to hearing a song or two or maybe three after the question and answer session because musicians like nothing better than playing for free. And I'll remind you again in the end, but if you have a question for our guests during the Q&A session, uh, you'll need to raise your hand, and Mindy will come sprinting to you with a microphone. Uh, and we need to have you on that microphone so you'll be heard on the uh, broadcast. Today we'll be learning about the careers of three professional musicians from Frankfurt. Please welcome Jason Wells, Gibson Wells, and Hunter Wainscott. Okay, this is where you talk. Thanks for having us, Michael. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank uh, Mindy and uh, obviously you, Michael, and all the people here at the library because I was really excited when she hit us up about this. Uh, some of my first experiences ever performing live were actually on this stage. So, what was that? Um, well, I was uh, actually in a musical production that was kind of like you know uh, some class for kids to get into theater and stuff. Uh, it was some. I forget the name of it, it'll play about insects or something. But, did uh, you act in this play? I, I did, believe it or not. I was like a, a wasp or something, some, wow. maybe a bumblebee. <laughs> I didn't yeah. know you had acting in yeah, your Yeah, me neither. As well. I think that might have been what, uh, what helped me figure out that I, it wasn't perfect. That you were a musician. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it was fun, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm gonna speak to each person individually for a minute, and then I'm gonna have uh, some questions that any of them can answer. Uh, and then you're going to ask questions, so be thinking of questions. Uh, Jason Wells has been playing and touring for many years. His father's record collection spurred his interest in music and started him dreaming of a career as a guitarist. The Jason Wells Band has recorded five CDs. You may have seen a few in the lobby. Please welcome Jason Wells. Born and raised. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, pretty much born and raised here. We did move away for a few years after o older, but we came right back. What so. grade school? Uh, Riley. Wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, well, was school in general, uh, going back to the beginnings, uh, generally a positive or negative experience for you? <laughs> uh, I asked the right question, I can tell. <laughs> I was generally uh, pretty, I didn't like school much. I wasn't, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I would get straight A's if I just tried, but that was my problem, I think, is what they tried to tell me. And, um, so, yeah, I didn't fit in too well in school, so couldn't wait to get out. Well, really. how old were you when you first like picked up a guitar and, and developed that interest? Um, it was about, Sixth grade. Well, I mean, I've always been interested and had it, but then I got my I got I got my first guitar when I was like for Christmas when I was in sixth grade. So after that, it was uh, that's about all I did. <laughs> Can everybody hear? Okay. 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 We'll try to add a little more volume. Is um, it emergency mic time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it seems like uh, most musicians are inspired by what they heard as a kid. You got a guitar in sixth grade, 
who were you listening to that made you want to have a guitar? Oh, I was listening to all the, like the, mostly like the classic rock kind of stuff that my dad was listening to, and, uh, but it was pretty much, uh, it kind of musically, it was like the, the jazz infused kind of rock music of the 70s, you know, that's really like, right. I've always been gravitate, gravitated to, and uh, yes. when, um, and, uh, and you know the the, <clears throat> the blues and the and the more traditional type of not traditional but just that kind of rock. You know, that's what I did. Grew the up blues on. Uh, uh, as something you play, did that come along later, or did you actually listen to blues music in your home growing up? Um, it kind of came along later. It was more of the just the, the music, and, and I kind of figured out a lot of it later um, in a lot of the history, and you know, and then, and then I, you know, I, I, I would go to bed out on the road, and I go to St. Louis or Chicago, and all this, and I, and I see actual blues players, you know, that have stories, and they, and it's like, yeah, I don't have that blues, I don't, and I never really tried to. I've always appreciated it and loved it and learned about it, but, but um, that's a whole, that's you know, really really do it. They, those guys live it. Mm -hmm. what, was, uh, what was the name of your very first band? Oh, my very first band. Well, that's hard. I don't know. I can't remember. We had like a bunch of dumb bands. I don't know if we ever... Now, there must have been a time when you couldn't play but you were learning and you owned the guitar and you went out in the garage with somebody and said, we're gonna have a band. Yeah, we had a lot of those. And it seemed, <laughs> yeah. And it seemed like uh, we changed, the, I don't think we ever really, <laughs> those, those never really got off the ground. I don't know if we ever came up with a name. <laughs> but we just kind of stayed in the garage for those. But uh, it really- People were probably grateful for that. D yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we couldn't figure out how to, hook up the drum set because the string, the cymbals were tied to the rafter, so we didn't know how to take that on the road with us. <laughs> so I was reading about you and I uh, saw a thing where for a while you decided to give up playing music and just take a regular job. Uh, how'd that go? And uh, what made you decide to uh, pick up music again? Well, I, you know, it was... Oh, you know how it goes. I mean, it, go, it was going. I, I mean, I had a job. I had a perfectly good job, um, except, you know, there was a lot that goes into that. You know, and if I could elaborate just a little bit, I yeah. guess. Um, you know, I, mean, I worked. I had a good job. I had a, like a skilled job that you know people kind of have to work for to get. And and um, but you know, growing up as a kid and in, in, in generations, it was like, well, you know, you do this and you do that, and then you go, we'll get a job, and then you retire from that job, and you do all. This. So there's all these, and there's all these living situations that contribute to help you do that. And by the time that I got to that age, all those things were not really working, like everybody said, like when I was a kid, you know. Um, the media and everybody was like, oh, you can't stay at a job longer than five years, you know, because in your you know you're not really helping and this and that. And I was watching people get laid off and lose their job right before they, you know, there's lots of went into that, you know. And so um, I got laid off and after they said that it, weren't gonna, it wasn't gonna happen and I got laid off and so there's a lot of back and forth like that. And so really, how'd it work out for me? I mean, I, I, was, I was working and I was a good worker, um, except I didn't wanna give my life over to something that I didn't trust. And I trusted my, my own work and my abilities a whole lot more than what I was seeing and hearing. So hmm. I went ahead and took that opportunity to, to just go make my own. And uh, you know, I, I doubted it ever since, but <laughs> here I am, so I'm still alive. And uh, Let's see. Well, right now, who are the members of the Jason Wells Band, and uh, what's your schedule looking like as we approach summer? Well, that's a good question, too. I've got a lot of good stuff this summer. Um, Currently, it's me yeah. on, on bass, yeah. and the drummer is whoever we want it to be. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, that's yeah, I got, line up right now. So I got, um, I've got, uh, some of you might know um, Brad Gunyon. He's from here. I went to school with him. Um, he was a little older than me in school. And long story short, he lives in New York. He's been in lots of good professional bands and stuff and all that. Um, we got reconnected, so I'm actually flying him into Indy, and then he's going to go on the road with me on some this year. And then we got Blake Watts. He's a really good drummer from Lafayette. From Lafayette. And then um, we got a show uh, coming up this year that we got one of my good friends from San Diego um, is going to be drumming for me, uh, Lamont Little. So, uh, so, I, and then we're going. We got a guy in Florida that's played with Tower and Pow Tower of Power and Blue Oyster Cult and Godsmack, and he's going to drum for us. Um, in November, I think, and maybe September and November, because uh, we got some tours coming up. So, so the Jason Moss band is more like the Jason Moss project. It's more like Where? it's more like Jason Wells, and yeah. then and then I I have the 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 most awesome musicians around, and they want to play with me, and I'm thrilled to have them play with me, and I and we have a really good time doing it. Right. So it's it's very fluid and and, a, and it's kind There's of times we have saxophonists you know in whatever region we're at uh, Michael Fortunato has uh, accompanied us or you know sometimes percussion usually yeah, usually yeah it's so just three piece though yeah the core of it's just three guys and then and we have more friends than just three, two right. other guys so sometimes we add more <laughs> so it's a whole lot of fun that way. All right, I'm going to skip over to Hunter Wainscott right now. All right. Uh, Hunter has been writing songs from an early age and <coughs> now performs all across the country as a solo acoustic folk rock country. Well, that's enough for now. Artist. <laughs> Please welcome Hunter Wainscott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You good? Doing well, yes, sir. Great to be here, by the way. Thank you all for, for showing up here. There's so many of you here tonight. And, means a lot to all of us to, uh, to be able to talk about our stories and to share what we're feeling musically and, and uh, where we've been and where we're hoping to go. So thank you all for, uh, for coming out tonight. It means a lot to us all. That's awesome. So exactly uh, how young were you when you wrote a song and what was the, you wrote your first song and what was the title of that song? So I was, uh, I was about six years old um, and I wrote a song. It was a worship song and it was called You Are My Child. And uh, I have not played it in about, well, over 20 years. Um, but a uh, funny story about that though, so I, I learned how to play guitar from Jason when I was about six years old. And I wrote that song about a week later um, after he taught me some guitar chords and everything and just been writing songs ever since, uh, pretty much, so. With your experience now, do you look back on that? I mean, did it, does it make sense, the song that you wrote? And isn't that surprising that you would have picked that up that quickly? It, it kind of makes sense in a way. Um, a lot of you know that I was, uh, I was homeschooled uh, growing up and uh, did not go to public school at all my entire life. And we didn't have any video games growing up or TV or anything. Um, I didn't hear real rock and roll until I was about 23. Um, so a lot of my wow. songs back then um, were written uh, because that's kind of all I had to do was uh, sit around and, and play guitar and write songs. And um, even from a very young age, it's always been like a, 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 an outlet for me uh, to share how I'm feeling, um, what I believe in, um, things I'm going through, uh, usually struggles I'm going through. <laughs> um, it's easier to write about the hard times sometimes than the good times. but. Um, looking back, it does all make sense in a weird way, I guess, if that makes sense. So if you want your child to become a musician, take away the TV, take away the phone. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, for me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it really is true, though. I mean, I have, uh, I have two kids of my own. They're, uh, they're seven and four. And my wife and I are trying to get away from that because nowadays there's just so much stuff on TV that... Um, it's just really just straight up weird, and it, it really kills a lot of creativity. And um, the big reason I started playing guitar was because there was guitars laying around, and the TV was not there. So it really helped me to become more artistic, I think, um, in the long run, for sure. Yeah, I know a lot of people wonder these days with kids, do, are they spending so much time watching that they're not 
creating themselves. Absolutely, and absolutely. And they're only creating what they're told to create. You know, there's these things on YouTube and, and on Netflix and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just makes kids, uh, I feel like, very narrow-minded sometimes um, and not really discover what their true talents might really be. Mm -hmm. They're just doing what they see done on TV and, right. and calling it quits, pretty much. Did you, uh, you said that you started playing guitar because they were laying around. Why were there guitars laying around your house? So that was my dad. Uh, my dad started playing guitar seriously around the same time uh, that we met the Wells family uh, when I was a kid. And uh, kind of the way musicians roll is there's always guitars coming in and out of the household all the time. And so there was always guitars laying around, people coming over playing guitar. And uh, I'm still that way with guitars. They're always coming and going, it seems like. But um, just having one there really uh, sparked some interest for me. They are, exactly, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a tool. To, uh, to access parts of your mind um, that aren't accessed any other way, I think. So I know you've played uh, both with a band and solo. Yes, sir. What's better? Uh, solo, for sure. <laughs> 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 it, was, it was fun having a band, but man, it's just, uh, a band's a marriage, and my, my band marriage just didn't end well. We just... Uh, <laughs> It, it, it was. Uh, Gibson was my drummer for a while, and that's not why the band didn't work out. He was actually the, he was, <laughs> a fill-in drummer. He was the best thing that happened to my band. Um, it was fun. It was, a, it was a real learning curve for sure. But overall, just solo is much more enjoyable for me, and um, I like it a lot better, definitely. Less stuff to carry. It sure is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So now, yeah. Uh, to you, what's more creative, writing a song or performing a song? I think it's both, honestly. Um, no, you have to pick one. I, I would, oh man, probably, probably ultimately writing the song, I would say, because um, I've written dozens of songs that nobody will ever hear, and those songs are for me. Um, so I, I feel like, um, like writing songs and, and making songs is more fulfilling in the long run. But that being said, sharing songs with people is almost equally as fulfilling too because you get to see reactions. You, you, you get to see how, how words that you wrote on a page can connect with people and, and touch them in, in their own way. Um, I've written so many songs that people hear and they tell me what it means to them and it's nothing what I had in <laughs> mind at all, but they connect to it in that way. So I'd say probably ultimately writing, but performing is like the icing on the cake for sure. Yeah, like writing is uh, creative. Yes, sir. And hard. Yeah. Sometimes. Correct. And performing, though, is the reward, I would think, in seeing the audience reaction. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how hard is it to get audiences, when you play, to listen to original material over covers? I found, I found it's gotten easier as I played longer. Um, in the early days, uh, when you're first trying to get a name for yourself and, and win over fans, um, Typically, they want to hear mostly covers. Uh, they want to hear songs that they know. Um, but as you play longer and, and establish those relationships, um, I feel like people are more open to, to hearing your own original music. Once they know who you are as a person, kind of get a feel for, for what you're all about, um, it's easier to share more and more originals. And that's what I'm very thankful for is, is so many people nowadays, more than ever, seem to be very into original music. Because um, we've, we've all heard the same covers a thousand times. and it's at the point now that when I travel and play music, um, I'll be across the country and I'll start playing like Tennessee whiskey or something. And somebody will stand up and say, man, you traveled like 24 hours to get here. Play something you wrote. You know? <laughs> um, we've heard that song enough and anybody can play that song. And, um, so I'd, I'd say overall, it, it's become a lot easier as mm -hmm. I've done it longer to get audiences to react to original music more. So you said you didn't really have a exposure to rock, like rock and roll music until you were very old, 23? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you say are your musical influences now? Oh, it's, it's really, <clears throat> it's all over the place. Um, there's a, it, it really depends on what day it is, honestly. I, I listen to everything from folk music to Americana. I love metal. I love uh, rock and roll. Um, here lately, I've been digging um, instrumental music a lot more, um, especially driving a lot. It's, it's, uh, it kind of allows you to make up your own story for a song sometimes, and uh, you're not being told what the song's about, so you just kind of have to make up your own narrative for it. Um, 
But really, uh, here lately, I've, I've really been listening to uh, some deeper cut, like country type musicians um, that aren't on the radio, really. Um, just always trying to listen to something new all the time. So I, I would say just music is an inspiration overall, um, no matter what kind it is. Thanks, Tony. Yes, sir. Uh, Gibson Wells is a multi-instrumentalist who plays all the, all the instruments on his solo recordings. He also plays with his father, Jason, and his skills in the recording studio uh, make him a desired session player and studio engineer. Please welcome Gibson Wells in the middle. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I want to say thanks again for having us here. This is uh, really cool seeing everyone show up for this. Um, we've been really looking forward to this. Uh, I want to give a shout out to, we got Luna Worldcast here in the audience. And they're uh, local legends as well. And uh, recently we just announced I'm going to be joining them on drums for some show. We have a tour coming up this summer, so really looking forward to that. So that's some pretty cool stuff I've got going on. Is this thing on? Yes, it is. All right, let's try that instead. So yeah, I just want to give them a shout out real quick and uh, thank everyone for having us here. When his mic wasn't working, Gibson was talking about Luna Worldcast, who are a duo and they're right down here. Uh, they're also one of my favorites, so I was happy to see them here tonight. Right on. Um, okay, I know be. you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. As they should be, Mike. <laughs> Uh, I know you've been asked this a million times. Were you named for the guitar? Actually, no. It's, um, it's uh, believe it or not, no, obviously it was after the guitar. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I hear the, the joke, the famous joke all the time, like, well, if we named you Fender, your name would have been Fender Wells. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess uh, Dad was able to convince Mom on that one. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's been nothing but fun times ever since. So, like, like Hunter was saying, uh, I also learned guitar from this guy right here. Um, he got he got to do it a little bit uh, sooner than me. But um, actually, funny story. I think uh, <laughs> yeah, Hunter's already scared. <laughs> um, well, my sister Alexa stayed at your guys' house the night I was. Uh, I was born, so yeah. there's a lot of history with between our families, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity for us to kind of like share that history there. So uh, yeah, we've been we've jammed and we've wrote songs and we've uh, played shows uh, ever since uh, you know just yeah. kind of growing up together in the same in the same town. And uh, I do live in Lafayette now, but I always try to stay connected to uh, Frankfurt and what's going on here. And um, really enjoy the music scene that's been kind of growing with uh, Creekside music and all the cool stuff that happens here. Like I was saying earlier, I did uh, some of my first performances ever were on the stage and it was that musical I was talking about and also my high school band, The Edgars, played here one time uh, a long time ago. Uh, I know me and, me and dad have played here. So really just oh. all this stuff's coming full circle and that's yeah. really cool to see. Oh, good. So. Well, it's good to have you back. People have been dying to see you again since you were a spider or whatever you were. In that show. Uh, so, uh, so how old were you when you started playing guitar? For some reason, I pictured you as an infant with a ukulele or something, but it was later. There definitely are a bunch of pictures of me like physically holding a guitar, very very young. But I did not really uh, get into it until I was maybe like ten. I'll be twenty-three in June for context. Well, so will I. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm the same age Hunter started listening to rock music, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh shoot, you, I forgot what I was going to ask you as a follow-up to that. He's what, a guy. Uh, he is. Uh, well, uh, what did you do? Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. Uh, much like a, a, a soccer mom or a football dad, were you forced into playing guitar, or did you so, choose yeah, it on your own? This is uh, this has come up a few times, and I've actually gotten ridiculed for like, <laughs> many, from all kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah, and I'd like to set set the record straight that I uh, there was there was a time where Dad would sit me down, and he would be like, "All right, this is a G chord, and this is a D chord," and I'd be like, "That's hard. I don't want to do that." So I just didn't, and he was like, "All right, well then don't don't play it then." Huh. And then I, a few years went by, and I was like. 
started watching uh, Steve Ray Vaughan and Joe Bonamassa and just, you know, like the, all the people like in the 2000s and stuff that were really big on YouTube uh, doing guitar tutorials and stuff like that. And I was like, actually, that looks pretty cool. I think I want to give that a shot. Oh. And it kind of just snowballed from there. So honestly, I did learn a lot more, uh, a lot more of my, like, I guess I kind of honed in my technique and stuff from a lot of YouTube tutorials and stuff mm -hmm. like that, that I, from players that I admire. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of blanking right well, now, but. Well, that's like the whole new way of, of learning, learning anything. I mean, people are building houses from YouTube, YouTube University. videos. So. Uh, what? YouTube University. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I saw some guy play guitar. He's like Australian or something. He plays on. It's got nothing to do with anything. Joe Robinson? Huh? Was it Joe Robinson? He's an older guy and he. Tommy he, Emmanuel. That guy. Yeah. yeah. Joe uh, Robinson is actually a, a, a sort of a student of his. Oh. And that's, uh, that's actually one of the people I was about to bring up. Is, yeah, he, was, uh, he won Australia's Got Talent when he was like 14. Oh. And a Tommy Emmanuel kind of took him under his wing after oh, that okay. point. And he was a big influence for me because I was around the same age uh -huh. then. Yeah. Huh. Um, OK, you're a multi-instrumentalist. I assume that means you play more than one instrument. It's uh, I th technically guitar, bass, drums, and some piano. That's, that's about it. And I do you know, write songs, actually. Uh, there was a, I don't know if you remember the songwriter competition they did for the Hot Dog Festival like a few years back, but it, they had a whole uh, sort of uh, class with Kyle Cook. He, yeah. he uh, was kind enough to kind of hang out with me and some of the other um, contestants and talk about songwriting and uh, his experiences with Matchbox 20 and his solo stuff, and that was kind of, that was in here. So that was pretty cool. And, yeah. So yeah, I've been writing for a long time. Uh, that kind of turned into me wanting to record my songs that I wrote. That kind of turned into me wanting to record all of the parts. So uh -huh. I learned uh, bass and drums since probably freshman year, uh, kind of around there. And I've just been kept up playing all three. This is something I was going to ask later, but I'm going to ask right now. Um, what do you guys, all three of you, think about do you think that you're kind of born with the knack for music? Or do you think people learn that? Because I have a theory about it. I think, um, you know, that's, that's a good question because people kind of, uh, anyone that ever, you know, kind of strives for art artistic endeavor or like, could be anything, music, art, uh, like in the gallery out there or whatever, like people see that and they, they don't see the time, they don't see the work, they just see the outcome. Or they, they see Hunter you know, playing his new song or releasing a new album or whatever, they don't, they don't see what, what, the, what work went into that, all, all the, not always anyway. So there are, there are exceptions to that obviously, but um, I, I think, yeah, a lot of it, it, talent is not inherent, it is, it's an investment of time and uh, abilities that you have to hone I mean, I've been, I've been playing guitar for almost 12 years, probably recording and producing other artists for almost eight at this point. And I would say I've definitely, I definitely didn't know what I was doing at all when I first started. Yeah. And Just learn by doing it. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's an investment for sure. Well, I thought about it when Hunter said, you know, he started learning how to play guitar and a week later he writes a song. And I'm like, he has the music gene. Yeah, I think he's just a freak. Not everybody would do that. Huh? <laughs> no, I, think, I think Hunter's just, uh, he might be one of the, the few that, the exceptions, but that, that definitely is not how it works for me. Yeah. But yeah, that's It's just that's weird crazy. for everybody, really. Like, almost like anything, like if, if you choose to want to do it, you'll get better at it. And then even if, even if you have the knack, like the longer you do it, the, the better you'll get. And, but it's, it's always work. Yeah. It's always work and always learning something new. Definitely. You know? Uh, Gibson, for you personally, which kind of leads into this, actually, uh, is it easy to write a song or is it a struggle, or both? Depends what kind of song you're writing. Um, I think, I think uh, writing a song should, at, at the very principle of it, be very easy. In the sense, it shouldn't be hard to understand. 
Um, you know, like Hunter was saying, it is up to interpretation. I think there, I think a good song leaves, uh, you know, multiple inter interpretations possible, but just kind of like, um, you know, don't, don't make it too hard on yourself, you know, just really write how you feel. Um, so you try to make it rhyme. What was that? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to write, the next one you're going to write is going to be better anyway. I mean, it's really just, you just got to keep at it. Um, do you have a favorite guitar, or is there a guitar you would love to own? Uh, the answer to the question is yes, I do have a favorite guitar, and I already own it, yeah. um, thankfully. Uh, and it is, my granddad, was my granddad's HD, Martin HD 28. Wow. And uh, I thought about bringing it tonight, but uh, it's, it's a little old, and I don't, I don't love to travel with it because it's very, obviously a very sentimental, a lot of sentimental value, value there. And uh, so, yeah, my granddad uh, passed away 2000, in 2011, and he had that Martin since probably what, the late 90s or something. Yeah, and uh, very, very thankful to... <laughs> Skipped right over, huh? Yeah. No, I think uh, really what happened was he passed it to him, and Dad thought I should have it. So that's what happened there. Okay, in uh, five words or less, what does a recording engineer do? No, I was kidding. Fix everything. <laughs> I was already kind of thinking that, and then he kind of helped me out on that. Uh, Gibson spends a lot of his time recording now and recording other people and producing, uh, I guess. Yeah, I so know. I have been working for the studio called Rec Room Recording, which is located in downtown Lafayette. Um, the Taft building used to be uh, Tippa Canoe Arts Federation, but now it's just the Arts Federation because they do a lot of work with uh, surrounding counties and stuff. So it's, it's a really cool space. They have, you know, dance studio and uh, reception hall upstairs. But uh, we have been operating since 2020, uh, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. That's when we opened. But uh, we kind of made it through COVID. And, um, yeah, I've been working with a lot of artists since uh, we've been able to fully reopen. I'm trying to kind of make it my full-time gig. I'm still doing a lot of gigging and stuff, like with different bands. Obviously, still love that. Um, I was doing some part-time retail, and I recently kind of got out of that because I just want to really focus on my passion. And uh, I have think I've released... There's only been one album this year that I've uh, been a part of that's released, but I have two more in the works and two more that are about to start. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to share that. Uh, I now have some questions for all of you. I, I have too many questions because I want to I wanna let these folks uh, ask you some questions, too. So I'll see if I can find a good one. Uh, in this age of social media and YouTube, which we were talking about, how has being a musician changed? Are there more opportunities to play and record or less? Definitely more, yeah, hmm. definitely more opportunities. I mean, I would agree with it's, that. It's it's changed a lot, but and um, but I think it's you know in some some ways it's it's like it's given m way more opportunities to record and release music and, and all that, but it's gave up it's given opportunities for everyone, which um, the the old model doesn't like that um, because it takes away from piece of the pie, but. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it just opens it up for people to be creative and create what they want a lot easier. And Did you mean it it's kind of cuts the middleman out between the artist and an audience uh, more? Yeah. yeah, that's what I yeah. feel It like. can, yeah. for sure. I mean, there's definitely been times, uh, you know, networking is so much easier now on, like, Instagram even. Like, I've just hit up a band that was playing at a place that maybe a band of mine just played at and they have a similar sound, and you just kind of are like, hey, I think we would fit good together on a bill. Do you want to try putting a show together? And sometimes those aren't the most lucrative, but at least you know, you're making connections and you're getting into a new place that you wouldn't have if you didn't just reach out to somebody. 
and, and social media and all the things that we have at the, of our, we basically have all the tools that whatever industry people would have. It's just a matter, um, I think what happened was uh, it's hard for the artist to have the art and the creativity and then also know how to take that out and make it palatable or presentable or marketable on their own. And that's where the industry people would come in and I think that's what you're talking about is let's make it easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does, but it doesn't necessarily make, that doesn't necessarily make it easier for the musician to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and so there's still industry things going on, there's still agents and there's still all this stuff, but it's just really opened it up. It's opened up um, a lot more tools for everyone to, to do what they need without that one person that holds the gate, you know, the keys to the gate, you know. Can any of you uh, recall a, a moment where you were playing music in front of people and you just had the thought, you know, this is the best night ever? <laughs> Hunter? Many, many times, many oh. times. Um, and really, I, I really mean this too. Um, COVID really helped me realize this more, but every gig is the best night ever at this point. Um, it, was so, it was so easy before COVID, and not to get on the COVID thing, but before COVID, it was easy to take shows for granted, I think, at least for me. Um, and then one day, um, I played a show, and it was my last show for months. Mm. And, and now every night going into it, you know, five, six nights a week, it's like this could be my last show. It could be my, la my last time to connect with friends and fans. And that makes it the best night ever. And that way, leaving a gig, even if something goes wrong or the, the PA doesn't work during the game, whatever it is, like. It ain't nothing every, compared to what yeah, we did. Which, what we which did. never happens, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Gibson, it's, it's that's when you just one. sing louder. <laughs> exactly, yeah. that's right, that's right. Organic. Uh, do you recall a moment recently where you thought, worst night ever? Was this for me? Well, yes, Everybody. because you smiled, so you were thinking of something. Well, I was actually, actually, I was thinking of the first question because, um, yeah, I, I really do agree with Hunter, and but there, there's always highlights, you know. You always have that one show that always sticks with you, you know. For me, uh, a couple of summers ago, me and me and Dad with uh, Jason Wells band played at um, uh, Bill Monroe, Bill Monroe uh, Park Blues Festival, and that was a really awesome set, and actually. Uh, I met my current girlfriend that night, so there's a lot of, you know, good memories come from that, and she, unfortunately she couldn't be here because she had to work, but uh, yeah, I'm always thankful for those kind of memories, and, but to go back to the, maybe like a bad show, I mean, there's always going to be shows where you wish more people were there or something, I mean, but yeah, it's really just about not taking it for granted, like Hunter said, and like, even when there's no, I take it as an opportunity to just practice songs that I wanted to play. Yeah. You know, if there's yeah. no one, if no one's there and you feel like, you know, you're not getting the engagement that you were hoping for or whatever, like, there's, there's still value in that. And uh, that only, that only uh, happens, you know, every so often, depending on where you're at. But there's always, there's always something uh, of value to be taken from it, for sure. I think my worst show ever, honestly, that there was a bad one. It was in Monticello at the, at the Summer Dock. And my, my old drummer, God bless him, uh, had too much fun and passed out on the drum kit and fell off the stool. So that was probably the worst gig I ever had, probably. But uh, it's been uphill from there. Did you just so. leave him there? Or? Don't worry, I was OK. Almost. <laughs> it wasn't Gibson. It was not Gibson. Yeah, that was uh, some colorful embellishment. Oh, yeah. I'm going to stop asking questions and, uh, right now and ask our audience if they have any questions for the guys. I'm looking for Mindy. There she is. Uh, I'll remind you again, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand just like school. And uh, it'll take a second because Mindy just returned from vacation and she's kind of lazy tonight. Oh. But in, at previous shows, I've seen her dive over rows to get somebody a microphone. So don't be surprised if that happens either. OK, anybody have any questions? Uh, right down here. Don't, oh, he's got, he's got the mic already. Oh, you got it. I got the mic. What's up? <laughs> What's up, Brock? Um, 
my name's Brock White. Um, I want to say real quick, these guys are phenomenal musicians. They deserve all the praise. And just never take them for granted because, I mean, these guys, they, they go on the road and they, you know, they leave their families. They go do this thing to follow their dreams. So I just want to say that's really incredible. Um, so a round of applause to them, please, if you would. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Brock. Uh, also, on a personal level, these guys have directly impacted my musical experience. Um, just playing like the open mics and stuff at the Rossville Water, that, that's just been like over the moon for me. I mean, I played since I was 13 on and off, and uh, you know, Hunter's, Hunter's uh, hosted these open mics for almost three years now, and I mean, I've continued to want to play, even having a full-time job and a family. It's kept me inspired to want to play, so I want to say thank you to these guys. Always Hunter, of course. Um, but to quit rambling, pardon me, um, I want to know what you all, as, as well as you can explain it, what would you say is like the, the highest musical milestone you've reached within your musical careers? Oh, boy. I would say for me... Um, Man, honestly, for me, the uh, the biggest the biggest personal milestone was probably when I was able to take the leap to become a full time musician. Because um, there, again, going back to Mike's question about the highs and lows, there's always highs that that feel like the highest point sometimes. But uh, for me, it, it was that moment where um, I just felt like I was ready to to take that leap and and not knowing what was going to happen. But uh, it was scary. It was crazy. Um, it still is scary and crazy, um, but that was probably the highest, um, just all around craziest moment um, of, of my own musical career. Besides when we freestyle together, open mic, that's also pretty crazy too. <laughs> that, that's a high point, but, uh, but no, probably that overall for me. Um, yeah. We had a question down here, Miss Mindy. I thought about narrating as, as Mindy walked, just like what her inner monologue might be, but okay. Before I pass it to him, I've got a comment. Is this working? Okay. Yes. I've noticed there's been a lot more community stages being built in little towns and little townships, and you know, what a great use of taxpayer money. Yes. Is this giving you guys more gigs? In the long run, yes. Um, I feel like, on, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the long run, like out and about all over, just in the mindset of the people and just in communities all over, you're right. Like we have one and it's state of the art and it's top, it's so awesome. And, and I've been telling, Everyone, my agents and the people I'm working with, and all my musician friends, like every one of these small communities are having community events, are having stages, are putting in stages now. They're looking for bands. It's it just seems like, and like what Hunter was saying, <clears throat> like after COVID, like how it affected us, and is like every gig that we have now is like I'm just thankful to be here and and be able to play music still, and. And I feel like that is, that kind of eye-opening experience is kind of happening in a lot of communities too. And, and music is now becoming a lot more appreciated and understood and, and, uh, and brought in back into society again, instead of maybe polarized into drunkenness and church music. You know, I mean, the church music is good, but it's, there's a, there's, a society that can provides share. the communities uh, a place to go watch a band in a safe space that's not you know like a smoky right. bar or whatever like yeah. he's saying yeah and like the the stage downtown here is awesome and we've had some great shows there and um, really looking forward to but they're popping they're, up everywhere yeah. yeah they are seeing how that grows you got it okay all right uh, I'm going to direct this to Hunter, but uh, Gibson and James, Jason, if you want to join in, it's fine. But uh, not being a musician, um, I'm wondering kind of the chicken or the egg. Which comes first, the lyrics or the music? 
or does it work either way? And if you write the music, how do you make the lyrics fit the music? If you do the s lyrics, how do you, how's that all happen? I have no idea. <laughs> That's a great Camp, question. Does a, does it, a campfire it, help you it, inspire? Yeah, so backstory on my friend Greg. So he lets me go to his house sometimes and spend the night at his cabin and write songs. And I've written several songs there, one of which is on the new album. It's called uh, Misfits and Believers. Um, but it, it really, it goes, uh, it just depends on what I'm feeling. I, I say for me, typically, um, the lyrics come first for me sometimes. Um, I've got, I think I have 400 notes on my phone of like partial songs, partial lyrics and stuff, and, um, or just recordings of me just uh, <coughs> saying words or, or just, you know, song ideas. I'd say for me personally, um, probably nine times out of ten, it's, it, it's the lyrics first. Um, I'm, I'm more of a, a lyrically driven artist. Um, I'm not the best guitar player in the world, I'm not the best singer in the world, but I like to get, you know, share a message somehow and share what I'm feeling. Um, make the, the songs lyrically driven. Um, so I'd say for me, probably lyrics, but there's also been times where we've been jamming in a barn and um, we all were doing a jam and, and just, just you know, making a really cool melody that we added words to later. So it just, it really varies, but lyrics for me, I would say. How about you guys? Yeah, um, I, I kind of consider like whenever there's lyrics but no music, it's kind of just poetry at that point. And um, if you happen to, you know, find a way to fit that into a song. For me, it's usually just happenstance. There's really no process that's, like he was saying, it's just kind of either or. Um, I will say I'm usually playing guitar more than I am writing. So, but that turns into writing uh, about maybe 30% of the time. Yeah, I, I think it's, I, there's times where I've had a feeling and I couldn't play it fast enough, and there's times I had words and I couldn't say it fast enough, you know, and I, so I think just putting them together is what Hunter's like, that's, the, it's, it's all, it all happens. It's going to happen, or, or yeah. doesn't, I guess. Yeah. So you write the words down, evidently, right? But if you're playing music, how do you remember what, you, what did I just play? How do you remember that? It, it happens all the time, for me, honestly. It, it's hard. Um, I have to uh, have your phone recording. Pretty much, sometimes, like j just to capture things. There's been many songs I think would have been great songs <laughs> that I, I did not hit it's record down the on drain. my phone. It's just gone for the ages for someone else to pick up down the road. But um, and then, of course, after you write a song, trying to learn your own song is a, a challenge for me sometimes because you, you make a song and then you have to memorize your own song and and learn your own song. Um, the good thing is playing a live show. If you mess up on a brand new song, no one knows, which is great. So there, there's a freedom there. So. I have one thing to add to that before we move on. Uh, I think there's something to be said, and I've done this maybe only once or twice, but some people have done it with really famous songs. Like, I, this is kind of cheesy, but Wonderwall. Uh, Noel, I forget if it was Noel or Liam, but like the guy, the, one of the Gallagher brothers, they said that they, they wrote that song years before it came out, and then they never wrote it down. None of it. Like, they just, it was just in their head. And they thought, well, if I can remember it for that long, it must be catchy. <laughs> and, you know, like, regardless of if that's your favorite song or not, it's, you know, it's a smash hit of the 90s. And um, I think that has partly to do with the catchiness factor. And I think he was right about that. If there's something to the song, you might just remember it. Yeah. But there, I wouldn't trust that. There's an old story about, that you've probably heard about Paul McCartney. Obviously, the music must come first because uh, the song Yesterday was originally Scrambled Eggs because he knew the tune, but he just make up words, and then he okay. put the words in later. Yeah. We have a question right down here. Yeah. We'll get to you, next. Love you guys, but i got to ask you. Will you talk about the first time you heard rock and roll? Like, what band? What was the situation? How did you make it to 23 years old, and what was the situation? Yeah, crazy story. I'll, I'll tell a short version of it. Um, so raised um, in the church, um, usually very strict uh, type churches. Um, was very bitter for a long time. I was homeschooled growing up, um, oldest of 11 kids, a very unique upbringing um, that I was very bitter about for a long time. And in the past few years, I've found a way to forgive and to learn from my, my past experiences, which I can't change. Um, but growing up, uh, we did not listen to any what you know secular music. Um, so I remember um, one of the first times 
on my own that I listened to rock and roll. I was working at Federal Mogul at the time, and I was married and had a kid. Um, I was a worship pastor at a church at the time, um, and I, I had never heard the song Sweet Child of Mine in my life. And some people in the break room were talking about Guns N' Roses, and I'm like, man, I really want to hear Sweet Child of Mine, and it blew my mind. Um, then I discovered bands like Metallica and bands like, I, I kind of started off with heavy metal and then went into country, still love country. Um, but uh, for a long time, like I said, I was very bitter about that and I was very a very angry person for years, which led to a lot of addiction problems for me, a lot of, of depression um, for a long time until I could let that go. And once I let it go, I saw the, the beauty of it for my own life is that I have a fresh slate um, I, I discovered the Beatles four years ago, you know, and people were laughing at me. I'm like, I discovered this great band. They're called the Beatles. <laughs> They're like, where have you been for 50 years? You know, like, well, uh, not there, obviously. But, um, but no, it's just a long story. But um, now as a, as a 30-year-old man, I can say that I'm thankful for what I thought was a curse in my life for a long time. Um, it just helped me become more of an independent person and and every day, I, you know, so many of you here send me links to new music all the time, and I love that because I'm always learning new music. Um, and that's how you know if you really like it or not, exactly. instead of just like yeah. growing up here and this is the best band of all time. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, it must be good then. Uh, Mindy, we have a question. This lady right over here. I tried to get somebody close again, but sorry. Uh, let's do one more question. Anybody else going to have a question? Because I would like to hear them play, and we don't want to go too long. Do I get more than one question? They're quick. Yes. Jason, uh, since you've got the most CDs out there, uh, have you written something? It's been, it's forever on this CD, and have you looked back a year or two later thinking, why on earth did I write that line? I wish I could change it. Or do you just let it go? <laughs> there's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of that. Um, there's probably songs that I'm like, well, I didn't need to put that on there, or there's lines, there's, there's, line, there's a song that's on my first album I redid on my later album on the vinyl um, just because on the first album I didn't even put the right line in the song. I left, I, in the studio I just for, didn't even, I left it out completely and I had to just put it on the album anyway, but if, like regrets as far as songs and that sort of thing, there's, there's probably uh, uh, some things that were a little hard hitting maybe, or for me at least, that uh, I've, I've had my own personal regrets, but I don't know if anybody else knows. It's all a journey. Yeah. And Hunter, um, for, for you, I don't think, is this on? Yeah. Okay, you were talking about this, the, the, your emotions, your bitterness, and things like that. And it comes out in your writing. Was it hard the first time to perform those songs knowing you were exposing yourself? Very hard. Very hard, but also very freeing once I did. Um, and I'm assuming when you get responses from people who have been through that. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, again, going back to songwriting and people responding, it just opens up a door for people to also be vulnerable with you about what they're going through. Um, and, and again, just how it's a healing thing for everybody, for sure. Does it bother any of you guys when you're out? Because I know at the boathouse, people are talking and walking around and you're trying, you're performing your heart out. Does that bother you, or you just does that just go with the business? Just don't yell free bird. I mean, it's all good. <laughs> oh, please don't play. That's right. Yes. That's right. Don't play free bird when I'm there. That's right. um, real quick, one, two, three, and Gibson's already kind of addressed this, but let's see, one, two, three. Favorite guitar player and favorite songwriter? Mm. I got a lot of favorites, but I would just overall. I think one of my go-to's is always and probably always will be Eric Clapton, just because he's did a lot of projects. He's done. He's always been himself, and he's always and he's write write some great tunes. And anybody, you know, I just I've always admired his career. And and uh, there's a lot of great guitar players that I look at for lots of different reasons, but I just I've always admired him. 
as a guitar player in his career and his songs and all that? Um, I, there's too many to choose uh, about the guitar player thing, but I think the a songwriter that definitely influenced me a lot is Tom York of Radiohead, but that's just the right place, right time kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know if I could really choose a uh, favorite guitarist, to be honest. There's, uh, I would say definitely, um, like I was saying, Steve Ray Vaughan was a huge influence on me, like really young. Um, when I kind of started to get older, got into more like Eric Johnson kind of style, like Steve Vai. Um, but yeah, they're, they're all great for their own reasons. Uh, Tony Iommi, um, yeah, Hunter. It's kind of cheesy, but I would say my, my favorite guitar player is my brother, Eli. Um, the, the kid is amazing. He's my best yeah. friend. Um, I, some of you have heard him play. He's just phenomenal, and we play so well together, and he does things on guitars. I don't know where he learned them from or how, but it's amazing. Um, I hope you guys all get to hear him play sometime. But my favorite songwriter, um, there's a lot, so many, but my top songwriter is probably Neil Young. I really appreciate the simplicity of his lyrics. Um, just how he makes a point and drives it home, and it's so simple, it's, e it's easy to overlook. But I'd say probably Neil Young, right now, for me. Okay, I think we'll uh, call a halt to this right now. If, I'm sure the guys will be around afterwards if you would like to come up and say hi to them if you have any questions, but I'm kind of anxious to get to the songs. I think we're gonna hear uh, a song that each person uh, has written, or I think so, uh, and the other guys are gonna help him out so uh, we'll see how it goes we've never uh, done a concert before I don't know what you're gonna do about singing without a mic there oh. um, so I, I'm gonna leave these guys to do what they do I'm gonna come out and come back to wrap it up This song is from the, uh, the new record, uh, which is three, that come through, which is three weeks old. Um, this song is called Old Souls. Seeking no crown, I feel most like myself when nobody is around. When the Wi Fi is slow, it doesn't bother me. I hate looking at my phone, rather look at the trees. My car has got some years, and so does my guitar. I wasn't raised around money. Learn to work real hard And all the people that I meet Make an impression on me I don't have much to my name But Lord, I can say that I'm free So the old souls Raise your glasses in a toast And let's celebrate together but really it's love that matters most To the whole, whole souls Trying to slow things down To the whole souls Trying to slow things down I don't drive too well With the people my age I'd rather play right here at the library with you guys Than on any big old stage, y'all Cause everybody's just so busy And so worried it seems You gotta step outside Turn off the old TV Oh, I've got a really old soul Over what it's worth I have a love for my family 
love for mother. So the old souls raise your glasses and a toast and let's celebrate together. Really, it's love that matters most and to the old souls. Try to slow things down. And to the old souls, try to slow things down. Try to slow it down. Tell them about it, Gibson. Trying to teach my children about the golden rule. But it's just so hard when they're not taught that in the public school. The greed is in the money, and the power and the fame. Home must mean more to this world than just having a good name. And what's it really matter if you make it all in the end? But you've got no one that you can call friend. And so the old souls raise your glasses in a toast. And let's celebrate together. But really, it's love that matters most to the old souls. Trying to slow things down. To the old souls trying to slow things down. We're trying to slow it down. Hell yeah, good job, man. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Thank y'all. How about that lead guitar, y'all? Yeah. Pretty killer, right? <laughs> Gibson Wells. All right, so uh, this is the song that is on my first and only album currently. I'm actually, believe it or not, working on my second one right now. It's been maybe, it came out in 2018, how many, however many years later. I don't know how many years later it was. Uh, this is a song, it's called Don't Come Crying. <laughs> Come crying to me. It's over. If you want something to lean on, then find someone else's shoulder. Well, you can't dream on, or you can face your reality. But don't come, don't come crying. No, don't come crying to me. Don't come crying to me
So you just went ahead. Trust me. Ignored every word I said, but that's no surprise for me. You just keep me in the back of your mind. And remember me, and I'm not such a nice guy. But just don't come crying to me. Anytime I get a chance with a couple other acoustic guitars or a group of people or anything like this, I always like to do this song because uh, it's a fun song to get everybody singing along. And uh, it's one of my songs called Till I Get Home. And I got a music video of this. I did a real slow, slow version of it. There's a music video and I've got all kinds of guest people on there. Um, and the actual, uh, one of the guys in the video, he actually passed away um, from from an overdose, and, and they used that song in his service, and uh, and that was and, they, and the and the preacher had a whole big message out of the lyrics of of that, and that's all about what it's all about. So uh, I thought that was pretty awesome. That's a pretty awesome story about that song, and it's been used in lots of different things. And uh, so anyway, this, here it goes. Traveling down. This lonely road, traveling down this lonely road. I am weak, I am torn, one day closer till I get home. I'm a stranger, a strange land. I'm a stranger, a strange land. See me fall where I stand. As I walk as a homeless man, I'm traveling down this lonely road. I'm traveling down this lonely road. I am weak, I am torn. Won't be closer till I get home. That golden shore, well, I've got kin. That golden shore, they're not lonely, that's for sure. Love to see them just once more. I'm traveling down this lonely road. I'm traveling down this lonely road. I am we. I want 
you guys to echo. So Gibson can echo. You can follow me, or you can follow Gibson. Ready? Traveling down, Traveling down this lonely road. This lonely road. Traveling down, Traveling down this lonely road. This lonely road. I am weak. I am weak. I am torn. I am torn. One day closer till I get home. I'm traveling down, traveling down this lonely road. Traveling down this lonely road. Well, I am weak. I am torn. One day closer. Till I get home I'm traveling down This lonely road I'm traveling down This lonely road I am weak I am told One day closer Till I get home There you go This lonely road I'm traveling down Lonely road traveling down this lonely road. Well, I am weak, I am torn. One day closer till I get. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to thank uh, Jason, Gibson, and Hunter for taking the time from their schedule to come share their music with us. Uh, fabulous, guys. That was really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please give yourself a hand for being here. Uh, my thanks also to my library partners in crime, Mindy Emsweiler, and the hardest working man in show business, Daniel Robertson, up in the booth. I also have to say hi to Ty and Candace. They made me. Um, we'll be back here on May the 10th when Hoosier Storytellers will chat with Red Barn Summer Theater Artistic Director Michael Taylor and two former members of the Company of the Red Barn, Tom Bewley and Jen McGill. They'll be talking about the 56 year history of the barn as well as the barn's upcoming season. Thank you all for coming. Thanks again to these guys. Thank you. Storytellers is a presentation of the Frankfurt Community Public Library. Bye.